You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Welcome to this episode of the Disease Du Jour podcast on feeding the thin or rescued horse with Claire Tunis, PhD, a private equine nutritionist. I'm your host, Carly Sisson, digital editor of Equimanagement, along with my co-host, editor Kim Brown. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2023 by Merck Animal Health. Dr. Tunis is an equine nutritionist who owns Clarity Equine Nutrition based in Gilbert, Arizona. She works as a consultant with veterinarians, horse owners, and trainers globally to take the guesswork out of feeding horses, and she provides services to select companies. As a nutritionist, she works with all equids, from World Equestrian Games competitors to miniature donkeys and everything in between. Born in England, she earned her undergraduate degree at Edinburgh University in Scotland and her master's and doctorate in nutrition at the University of California, Davis. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Tunis. Hi, it's great to be here. So do you want to start out by talking about how often veterinarians might be faced with the issue of feeding a thin horse? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm i lucky in that I don't run into too many thin horses, but, you know, I know they're out there. And I think that actually vets probably run into this um, more often than many of us who own horses might realize. And um, yeah, I think there's quite a few Horses that some who are really truly thin that we might think of as starved and others who are just sort of verging on thin who just maybe are challenged by, you know, other things going on in their lives or stress or a number of different things. Right. That's a great point. What are some of the usual causes of thin horses and how do you recommend that veterinarians address these causes? Yeah, I mean, I the you know, when I think back to being in grad school, I did a whole class on what was called energetics, right, which is just sort of the study of energy and and uh, it use in the body, and you know, there's that sort of basic kind of concept that calories in needs to equal calories out, and that if calories out is greater than calories in, you're going to lose weight. And obviously, it's not that easy. Otherwise, <laughs> a lot of us would find you know, weight management and ourselves a lot easier than than we do. But in its simplest form, you know, we're just not getting those horses the calories they need, or sometimes we are, and there's something else going on, right? So when I when I look at a horse and I body condition score that horse and determine that it's underweight and, and needs to gain some weight, then I look at the diet and I say, okay, is this horse actually being fed the calories that its requirement, NRC requirement suggests it needs? And if, let's say, the horse needs 25 megacalories per day and it's being fed 35 megacalories per day, and the horse is still underweight. So then my brain is going, okay, what's going on here, right? Why is this horse under, shouldn't be underweight? Is it an internal parasite issue? Is it, is there something going on with that digestive tract where it's not functioning optimally? Does the horse have gastric ulcers? Is there some kind of hindgut disruption? Um, is there some other kind of condition going on? Like, does, is it a senior horse and it has PPID? What's the quality of the feed that's being fed, right? Is the hay uh, sort of not a great quality and so it can't get adequate calories out of that forage to maintain itself. So I, that's when I kind of start looking looking at things. The simplest form is when I look at that horse and, and look at its requirement and kind of say, okay, it needs 25 megacalories per day and I'm estimating you're only feeding it 20. Well, then we're not feeding it enough calories to maintain itself. We need to feed more calories. That's why the horse is underweight. But I definitely run into a good number of horses, those hard to keep horses that are being fed significantly more than on paper it says that they need. And so I'm always curious then like what else is going on right and I assume that age and illness are fairly common causes of underweight horses that we might not necessarily understand how their nutritional needs change as they get older yeah for sure and I and I would throw out there a story that I had of a horse who was you know he's probably in his late teens early 20s he dropped quite a significant amount of weight quite rapidly um, and really quite alarming to the owner and I mean you know more than 100 pounds in a fairly short space of time and obviously got the vet involved and because he was older older they thought okay maybe this is a PPID issue they did all kinds of blood work and CBC panels and the metabolic panel everything came back super. And on a whim, the vet decided to do a lame evaluation on that horse and actually determined that the horse had some hock pain. And I think they put the horse on Equiox or some other, you know, pain treatment for the hock pain that they determined. Lo and behold, the horse started gaining weight again. And so that was actually a really big, you know, lesson to me that pain can really 
you know, it's a big stressor, right? You're stressed. You're just on edge the whole time if you're in pain. And that can really cause, you know, you're just burning calories because you're stressed, right? Um, that that could be a really big cause of weight loss. And so you really have to look at everything with some of these horses. I mean, the obvious ones you go to are like, oh, it's teeth need doing. And, and I would throw out with teeth just because they were done six months ago doesn't mean to say that they don't need their mouths looked at again because something could have happened. They could have cracked a tooth. Some horses need to have dental more frequently. So I wouldn't write off teeth even if they've been seen six months ago for dental work. Right. So there is a difference between a thin horse and a horse that's actually been starved, which we often see in rescue cases. So how would you define a starved horse compared to a thin horse? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple of definitions. Um, there was some work done by um, McIntosh et al. where they have a definition of, of a starved horse. And their definition is not having anything to eat for at least five days or that it's lost more than 15% of its body weight in the previous 60 days or less and has no other unassociated health problems. So I think that the no other unassociated health problems is kind of a big component to the starved horse where it really is an issue that they're they're really not being fed enough. It's not that they have an underlying health issue. They're really being starved. Today's Disease Does Your Podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health's Protozil, 1.56% diclaserol antiprotozoal pellets. Effectively treating EPM doesn't have to be difficult. Reach for Protozil, easy to administer top dressed alfalfa pellets, a safe and effective treatment that starts working fast without a loading dose. Learn more at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Do not use Protozil in horses with known hypersensitivity to diclaserol. Safety has not been studied in breeding, pregnant, or lactating horses. For complete safety information, please read label. Can you discuss the recommended refeeding protocol for an emaciated horse that's been starved? Yeah, so there are, you know, scientifically kind of created research ways of bringing a starved horse back. And it's it's not as simple as just throwing a bunch of feed at it. And I think that there's sometimes a temptation among owners to want to really put a lot of food in front of these horses because they know they've been starved and they're, you know, they've, they've taken in this starved horse out of the goodness of their own heart and they just really want to you know, feed it and make it feel better and gain weight, but you can literally kill them <laughs> if you if you do it wrong. Um, and so it takes a lot of kind of self control. You know, you have to feed very very small amounts. And the work that was done by Witham and Stahl out of UC Davis, uh, looking at starved horses, they really recommend using alfalfa as the forage of choice when bringing a horse back um, from being starved that you really need to feed like low starch or carbohydrate. That's really important. You really don't want to get their sort of glucose levels up high. You need to feed very small frequent meals and then sort of lower the milk glucose and insulin levels after the hay meal. So you, you don't want to feed a lot of concentrate. So really ideally you start off by feeding, you know, very small alfalfa meals um, so that you have a low non-structural carbohydrate content and you have a low insulin response. And that's really important because if you spike insulin too high, um, you know, some bad things can happen. Additionally, alfalfa, the mineral profile of alfalfa is generally considered to be really helpful to these horses when they're coming back from being starved. Alfalfa is a little higher in magnesium and phosphorus and other forages. Alfalfa is a better choice unless you have a, you know, if you have a tested grass hay that you know for sure is low in starch and sugar, you can use a grass hay. Um, but generally that recommendation is that like the first one to three days, you only feed 50% of the horse's digestible energy requirement. And then on days four and five, you increase that to 75% of their of the horse's digestible energy requirement. And then on day six, you can feed 100%. So it, you know, you're still really underfeeding at the first few days. And I think that can be a struggle to people. You do not want to put a salt block out for those horses like you did it can really kind of mess with them. So generally, um, you don't give them like any salt for like the first two weeks and then you can put salt block out. The first week to 10 days is is really, um, really small meals. And so again, that you're looking at feeding a pound of alfalfa every four hours for the first three days. It's, you know, what is that? That's like a handful. I mean, that's nothing, right? So it's, that's really challenging for people to feed that tiny amount. And it's a lot of work because it means that, you know, you're up around the clock feeding these horses. And then you can increase it. Their recommendation is you can increase it to about four pounds and decrease the rate to like every eight hours for the like four to seven days. 
uh, and then you can increase that rate up to about two weeks. So it is a very slow, uh, slow, slow thing. There is a protocol by uh, Macintosh for refeeding with grass uh, hay, and they recommend feeding like two pounds of grass hay every four hours for the first three days, increasing to eight pounds every eight hours for days four to seven, and then continuing at that rate until day 14. And then you can slowly increase it from there. And I wouldn't be looking to put any kind of commercial feed in that horse's ration for at least the first two weeks. All is very important for veterinarians to consider when they're working on rescue cases. Is there anything else you want to add about refeeding either a thin horse that's thin due to underlying pathologies or age or feeding an emaciated horse? Yeah, I, you know, when I do go to the commercial feeds, I gravitate towards the high fat, high fiber feeds. I generally stay away from those high starch type feeds. So I'm looking at some of those Senior feeds that are out on the market, you know, they're generally more digestible. There are some nice kind of high fat, high fiber senior feeds out there with a lot of beet pulp in them that are kind of 10, 12 percent fat. Um, those are really useful. In the case of a starved horse, I'm not going to introduce those for like the first two weeks, as I mentioned before. With a horse that's just thin, obviously, you can, you know, start those right away. Just, you know, read the feeding directions, make sure you're feeding them appropriately, because some of those senior feeds are really meant to be complete feeds and the horse's entire diet. And so I see a lot of people feeding senior feeds and only feeding, you know, one or two pounds a day when the directions are to feed more than that. And that's going to leave your diet deficient in some really key nutrients. And that's not going to help your horses underweight, right? So that's another thing I think sometimes horses can be underweight actually because their diets. I've had horses where they were getting enough calories, but they were nutrient deficient in that they didn't have enough like trace minerals, vitamin E, other nutrients. So they couldn't actually metabolize the calories they were being fed properly. So that's a really key thing to look at. It may not be a calorie issue. It may be that their metabolism is not able to work optimally because they're missing key nutrients that make all those metabolic pathways work properly. So it's really important that, um, you know, the, the veterinarians actually make sure that their clients are feeding, they, they've picked the appropriate feed and that they're then following those feeding directions. And the senior feeds are always kind of a go-to because as I say, they tend to be a little higher in protein, more like 14% protein. They generally are a little bit more digestible. They rely on fermentable fat, you know, the lower non-structural carbohydrate, those kinds of things. But you've got to make sure you're your only, you know, you won't, you won't get the full benefit of them. Right. Do you have a favorite hay type to feed for harder keeping horses? Ooh, that's that's a tricky one, right? Because it's hard to make blanket recommendations because it's hard to know why that horse is underweight and, you know, whether it does have any underlying, you know, kind of pathology going on. But assuming that it's okay for a horse to have some alfalfa in their diet, I'm, I'm a big fan of having some in there because it generally is higher calorie per pound and it has a slightly higher, you know, obviously higher protein content and the protein, the quality of the protein is a little bit better. Um, I generally don't go above 20 to 30 about 25, 30% of the entire forage intake as alfalfa. So that's sort of like my sweet spot. But I can find, and again, some of these senior horses, if they're underweight or just even underweight horses in general, can be a bit picky and not have a lot of desire to eat a lot of food and, you know, show a horse that doesn't love alfalfa, right? I mean, there's going to be one out there. Some, one of your listeners will be like, well, I have a horse that doesn't like alfalfa. But generally speaking, horses really love alfalfa. So um, adding a little alfalfa can be can be beneficial. But, you, you know, you'd have to be careful that you don't have, you know, again, like, is it underweight because it's got a renal problem, right? And in which case you might not want to feed alfalfa because of the high protein uh, that you then have to excrete out. So you kind of have to, you have to have the understanding of why the horse is underweight, but assuming it's totally healthy and just underweight, a little bit of alfalfa can be really useful. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Tunas, for joining us on this episode of Disease Du Jour. And thank you to our audience for listening to Disease Du Jour. And a special thanks to our 2023 sponsor, Merck Animal Health, who gives us the opportunity to have these discussions. Now, this was a really great talk, and if you have any questions or suggestions, you can send an email to Editor Kim Brown at kbrown, that's the letter K-Brown, at equinenetwork.com. <music>